Hello, everyone. It's such a great pleasure for me to be with you all. And I really thank the Navila Summer School team for the kind invitation. And I hope that my talk will be worthy of this important invitation. In the next few minutes, we will talk about all the potential application of the yellow micropulse laser in the pachycoroid spectrum disorders. And I will also show you the results of our recent study, and I will present some interesting cases that we can discuss together. First of all, we should define what we mean with the term pachycoroid disorders. We all know that the term pachy derives from the Greek and it means thick. As we can see in this beautiful picture, every, everything we see in the retina, it's not whole because as I always say, the choroid also contains a lot of information. And in all pachycoroid spectrum disorders, the choroid is really thick because we have large had a large uh, choroidal vessels. And we also, we also can see a thinning of the choriocapillary layer. Within the pachycoroid spectrum disorders, uh, we, can, we can have several diseases. And first of all, the most frequent one, which is the central serious chorioretinopathy. And then we have the peripapillary pachycoroid syndrome, the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, the pachycoroid neovasculopathy, and also the pachycoroid pigment epiteliopathy. Uh, some authors also believe that the focal choroidal excavation is part, is part of the pachycoroid, although it, it, we, we can find the focal choroidal excavation even in, in other conditions. That's why I didn't uh, put the, the, this disease inside this classification. In the next few minutes, we will focus on the first two diseases, the center series and the peripapillary pachycoroid syndrome. I use the word chronic CSR because as we all know for the acute forms, usually the treatment is not necessary because it solves um, within three months without any kind of treatment. But it is different if, is, if we have a patient with the chronic center series and we will uh, later see why. We all know that we have the, the, the photodynamic therapy, which, he, which represents an important treatment options in, the, in this patient. But we know that it is related to high costs to the vertiporphin injection. So we can consider it as a, an invasive procedure. And also we have the problem of the vertiporphin lack in the last two years. On the other hand, we have the yellow subthreshold laser, which is raising as a promising and interesting treatment option in this patient. And I will show you why I do consider this as a, 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 a first line therapy as well. We don't need any dye injection. It is a safe and repeatable treatment, and it is really easy to perform thanks to the navigated system. But what, what do we mean with the term navigated uh, laser system? As we can see in this image with the Navilas, we have the opportunity to plan the treatment in advance. We have the color fundus picture that allows us to control each step of the procedures. We can also put some caution areas, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, so for all, university, um, your, all universities, this is a, a procedure that also the residents can perform, as happens in, in the clinic where I work. This is an example. Uh, in which I show you um, a treatment with Navilas. I am performing here a peripheral treatment in a patient with a diabetic retinopathy. You can see here how I planned my treatment and I can control each steps. I can uh, draw the area that I want to go to treat. And also I want you to note that this patient is, I am not using any kind of touch, any, any kind of lens with this patient, is a no contact lens, 
that allows you also to perform a peripheral treatment, a central micropulse treatment, but also a peripheral conventional treatments, which is a really interesting option for our clinics. In this recent review, we summarize all the clinical application of the yellow subthreshold micropulse laser in renal diseases. So you can see here, here summarized the, the main, uh, the, the most important renal disorders, including diabetic macular edema, central serious chorioretinopathy, the renal vein occlusion, and other minor disorders. I am talking about, in these cases, of micropulse laser treatment. In this image, we can in this uh, slide we can clearly see how the the nebulous system allows us to perform a really precise treatment. Here we can see how we can treat the microaneurysm in diabetic macular edema, uh, or we can perform a peripheral treatment for both proliferative diabetic retinopathy, but also for the peripheral tears or we can perform a micropulse treatment for patients with central serious diabetic medullary edema, or also for patients with the uh, retinal vein occlusion. I am having some very good results in this kind of patient as well, but maybe I can show you the results in the next talk. But before going deeply in, that, in our presentation, I want you to, to know and to understand the differences between the conventional treatment on the left and the micropulse treatment on the right. With the conventional treatment, we see all these burning spots in the retina because we want to see them. What we want to reach with the, the conventional treatment is to close our non-ischemic peripheral areas so with the, with the navular system, we can uh, set a continuous wave laser, and then we reach, us, we reach what we call the coagulation threshold. This means that the tissue temp we, we reach the tissue temperature that allows us to see our burning spots. The, the thing is completely different when we set our system on the micropulse treatment. Usually I use the 5% duty cycle. And as we can see here, we use train of powers and the tissue temperature never reaches the coagulation thresholds. This means that the uh, the retina is heated, but we cannot. We, we will not see any burning or retinal scars. Uh, when we use the micropulse treatment, uh, what we uh, want to see is the production of the heat shock proteins and also the reduction of the pro-apoptotic and pro-inflammatory molecules at level of the retinal pigment epithelium. So as a clinical consequence, we have that the retinal pigment epithelium pump start to increase and the subretinal or intraretinal fluid starts to decrease. As I mentioned you before, I want to show you the, the applications of the micropulse retinal laser in these two conditions, starting from the center serious chorioretinopathy. The central serious chorioretinopathy is the most common form of pachycoroid disease, and it is characterized by the presence of subretinal fluid, and sometimes in the very chronic form, we can also have some intraretinal fluid. But most of all, we have these very large choroidal uh, vessels, um, and we, we all know that regarding the diagnosis of central serious, we need fluorescein angiography or ICGA could be even better. Regarding the treatment, we have several weapons that we could use. And as we all know from the literature, specifically from this really interesting review published a few years ago, the photodynamic therapy uh, seems to be one of the most promising treatment in this kind of patients. 
But we all know that the, the PDT originally uh, was described for AMD patients. So what we perform is an off-label application of the treatment. Here we can see how the photodynamic therapy uh, many times induce a complete reduction of the fluid, but sometimes it can also lead to the appearance of atrophic scars. And also uh, we know regarding the mechanism of action of the PDT that it, uh, it induces the reduction of the uh, choroidal thickness. So um, through the injection of the vertebrophrine, we perform the laser and we induce like an ischemic cascade uh, leading to a reduction of the choroidal thickness. But we should all consider, as we all know in our clinical practice, that in recent years, we are experiencing a lack of the vertebrophrine. So the PDT therapy is gonna be uh, tough and difficult to perform. And this is why in the last two years, I've been performing many micropulse treatments to have my own experience. And also because as we, uh, we said before, it is really safe. I have never experienced any scars or atrophic lesion. And I will also show and share with you the results of, of my study in the next few minutes. The literature already contains many papers published regarding the safety and the efficacy of the micropost laser in patients with chronic CSR. And also a friend of mine, Professor Chablani, um, recently published the, uh, this comment or also a consensus paper where he suggests the, the power that we should use in both diabetic macular edema and central serious choreoretinopathy. But now it's time to see, and uh, so I don't wanna use any more word, but I wanna sh show you the results of, of how these uh, laser uh, works. So we decided about one, uh, one year and a half ago to collect our cases in a prospective way. So we conducted a prospective study analyzing the efficacy, and also we try to find some predictive factors of treatment in patients undergoing the yellow subtitial laser. We perform fluorescein angiography in all patients, best correct visual acuity, OCT, and we also perform microperimetry in all our uh, study eyes. Here are summarized all the results. I only, I only want to remark that we had a, a complete subradinal fluid reabsorption in almost 80% of cases with the significant improvements of the best correct visual acuity after six months after treatment. But we also are collecting data for one year post-treatment and the retina is still dry. I will show you the results. This is the first example. And uh, we also measure the kind of leakage on fluorescein angiography. So we uh, divided patients classified as having a focal single point or diffuse multiple uh, points of leakage. This is a case of a 46 years old patient with a three years duration of chronic CSR. And we see a focal single point of leakage in the perifoveal area. This is the baseline OCT showing you, a, let's say, a small amount of subradinal fluid. This is the treatment that I perform. I usually perform an FA guided system. And I forgot to, to tell you something really interesting that the Navila system also allows you to perform FA, ICGA, or OCT and OCTA guided treatments. So for my patient with the CSR, I usually uh, perform FA guided treatment. So I perform fluorescein angiography, I see the leaking point and I draw the, the treatments uh, with the overlapping system. Here you see the treatment spots, and this is the OCT after one year. You can see that the retina is still dry. Usually at one month, is the, the, the 
subradinal fluid completely reabsorbs, but, but I wanted to show you also one month results because many authors believe that the micropulse laser treatment could represent a good short-term treatment option. But this is not what I experienced because I have very good results also at one year after treatments. I also want to show you the results of the microperimetry. You can see immediately from the picture, but also from the, uh, the number below, that we had a significant improvement, not only of the, the best correct visual acuity, but of the overall microsensitivity in the macular area, which is a, a, a point that we should uh, keep in mind. This is the second example. This is an interesting example because we have a, a 37 years old patient with a three years a duration of uh, chronic CSR. And also we have an OCT finding that most retinal specialists fear. I am talking about the subretinal fibrin, uh, which according to the literature is not considered a positive prognostic factor. But I, I decided to perform the treatment and you can see here the, the, the spots on the retina. Uh, on the leaking point, and this is the results at one year. Once again, we see a completely uh, dry radina with the significant improvement of both BCBA and microperimetry. In this case, the microperimetry improvement was still higher. We can see here how the sensitivity in the perifoveal region was low, whereas here we, we see a, a, an improvement, a significant improvement of the retinal sensitivity. In this other case, we have a 36 years old patient with the two years durations of uh, subretinal fluid, no previous treatments. And as we can see from the fluorescein angiography, we have a single but diffuse area of leaking. This is a pigment epithelium detachment, so it's not considered as a, a leaking area, it's a pooling more than a leaking. And we see here a large area of leaking on fluorescein angiography. The subradinal fluid amount is impressive. It was more than 700 microns. Here you see the, the results of treatment. And uh, in this case, I perform a second treatment because I had a six month a completely a dry retina, only at one year, uh, I had a small amount of uh, recurrence and I performed a, a second treatment with a completely dry treatment, a completely dry retina. So this is to show you that even with the second treatment, I can have a really good results. Once again, the significant, the, the retinal sensitivity significantly improved at one year after treatment, even after the second session. Uh, here we, we see a classic smoke stack leaking pattern. So we have a single focal uh, leaking pattern, but I want you to note this pooling area here in the perifoveal region, almost like a ring hyperfluorescence. Patient underwent uh, the, a, a PDT session more than two years ago, but he had a significant uh, recurrence of the, the disease, as you can see here. Once again, the subradinal fluid amount was important. And I performed here a, a treatment on the leaking area uh, above the, the, the fovea. And also I treated the, the ring of the pooling around the, the fovea. What we can see here is a completely dry retina at one year after treatment. Uh, I want you to, to note and to pay attention to the outer retina structure. This is another important point that I want, I want to stress uh, with the colleagues when I, when I talk about the micropulse laser treatment, because the outer retina is not demaged and we can see a, a relatively uh, integrity of the easy and external limiting membrane. And this is usually, this usually correlates with very good visual acuity improvements 
And as we can see in both best correct visual acuity, but also in all micro perimetry results that I'm going to show you in these slides. This is another interesting point of a myopic patient with a, a single leaking point in the uh, lower part of the, the phobia. And once again, you see the, the subradinal fluid completely reabsorbed at one year after treatments. And here you, you see the, the planning of my treatment. Uh, the microperimetry also showed an improvement of the sensitivity in the perifoveal region. Uh, here we have another example of a single point of leaking here uh, with a small leaking area around the, the point. And once again, I had a completely a reabsorption of the subradinal fluid at one month uh, related with the, an improvement of the sensitivity in the macular area. This is another uh, case uh, where I want to show you this uh, single but diffuse leaking area in the upper part of the macula. And I treated this patient uh, almost one year, 10, ten uh, months ago, and you see a completely absorption of subradinal fluid with an improvement of the microperimetry sensitivity. But I want to also share with you one case where I didn't have a, a complete reabsorption of the subradinal fluid. Uh, this is a case of a, a chronic disease with a, with a very long duration of the subradinal fluid. You see multiple points of diffuse leaking area on fluorescein angiography. And once again, we have the subradinal fluid here in the macular area. Here in this case, I performed the, the treatment only in, um, in, 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 in one session. I had a, a reduction of the subradinal fluid, but it was not complete. So my idea is that when we have subradinal fluid, we, we may experience a not uh, complete reabsorption of the fluid, but also the duration of the disease. Uh, it is reasonable that if I have a, a, a 12 years duration of the, the disease, I may have difficulties in the reabsorption of the subradinal fluid. We had a small improvement, but of course, not significantly of the radinal sensitivity. I don't want to bother you anymore, but I want to also discuss it with you. I want to discuss with you the application of the yellow micropulse laser treatment in this recently described uh, novel entity within the pachycoroid disorders which is the peripapillary pachycoroid syndrome. It has been described very recently by the group of um, Dr. Saraf as a distant uh, entity within the pachycoroid spectrum phenotype. And it is characterized by the presence of a nasal thicker choroid if compared to the subfoveal and temporal area. We see here how the nasal part of the choroid is thicker if compared to the temporal or subfoveal part. And it is also characterized by the presence of subradinal fluid and intraradinal fluid in the uh, peripapillary area. In um, a recent multicentric study uh, two years ago, we published the efficacy of the PDT in these kind of patients. Uh, and also in this other patient, in this other uh, paper published in 2022, the authors um, analyzed the long-term visual anatomical and functional results in patients with PPS, but no, no one previously uh, treated this patient with uh, navigated micropulse laser treatment. So I had a patient with, uh, that was referred to my clinic for, uh, a, with the diagnosis of central serious chorioretinopathy. Uh, you see here, he had multiple spots of hyper-orthofluorescence with FAF, 
better highlighted with this green autofluorescence, we see this, the pattern of the hyper autofluorescence in the peripapillary lesion. And also if, um, if you see these, uh, these OCT performed with the spectralis uh, enhanced depth imaging, you see the subradinal fluid, the intraradinal fluid in the nasal radia and the thicker choroid in the nasal part. Uh, I performed also a web source OCT, uh, which uh, shows you a very huge choroid and also better light the uh, thicker nasal choroid in these patients. So um, I decided it was during the COVID era, so uh, I had no vertebral offering, so I couldn't perform PDT, and I tried to, to perform the micropulse laser treatment to see how, how and if it worked. The OCT angiography was negative. We know that patients with PPS usually uh, do not show any kind of neovascularization. And here is the, 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 the leaking uh, pattern of this patient. And you can see how I applied the micropulse treatments in the leaking uh, areas. I want to also show you the results here. You can see the subradinal fluid that one month completely disappeared in the foveal region at three months, but a small amount is still present in the nasal part. But at six months, I had a completely reabsorption of the subradinal fluid in the total um, macular area. The intraradinal uh, uh, seeds were still there, but th this is something that I really, I experienced uh, even with the PDT treatment. So the, the, the treatment was, uh, was really good. The patient was, was, uh, uh, was fine and he also had an improvement of the visual acuity. And if you want to know more about this single and first case report about the, 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 the micropulse application in patients with PPS, you can read this case report that we recently published. So in conclusion, I thank you all for being with me during this time. And if you are interested in know more, you can read our papers or you can write me an email and I will be really happy to answer all your questions. And also I, I want to thank one, once again, the Navilius Summer School for this wonderful opportunity.